Good morning once again, church. Shall we pray? Please, Father in heaven, Lord, as we open your word, I ask that you open our minds and fill us with your Holy Spirit. Please remove any demonic influence, any interpretation, any interruption from your word. In Jesus' I, name I ask, amen. 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 We've been looking at the Sabbath, and we spent practically most of the whole summer looking at the Sabbath in the New Testament. And we even looked at those scriptures that uh, uh, might imply a Sunday uh, observance, and we looked at prominent speakers um, and what, what they had to say about the Sabbath, but then we also went to what the Bible has to say about the Sabbath. If you missed that, you can find that on our website at clevernsda.com and just go to audio there and you can see these sermons and what the Bible teaches. And a couple of weeks ago, we looked at the change of the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. And so the Bible gave us characteristics that pointed on how that change happened. The Bible there in Daniel chapter 7 gave us characteristics of this power, of this kingdom, of this organization that would intend to change the times and the laws of God. If you join me there in Daniel chapter 7, this is just a little review. Daniel chapter 7. In verse 8, here Daniel is in vision. And verse 8 says, I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little horn, coming up among them, before whom three of the first were plucked out by the roots. And there in, his, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth thinking pompous words. If you jump to verse 25, this same little horn, this same power, says, He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change the times and laws. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for times, times, and half a time. And the last time we looked at this, what characteristics pointed to this power? Who, who did we discover is this power that intended to change God's law? Who? The papal system, the Roman Catholic Church state. And I must, I must just briefly say, in case some might be new here, where I am not criticizing in any way Catholic people. On the contrary, they are, the most, they are more devoted than Adventist to their faith. And many, you know, my grandfather used to say, the best Adventists are ex-Catholics. Because with that zeal that they have for following God's will, they see the truths in the scriptures and they come and join God's church. They continue with that same zeal and, are, and uh, work for the Lord. We are not talking about individual, but we are talking about a system, an organization that, that the Bible here in Daniel chapter 7 describes as a power that we're trying to change God's law. And we saw that. This is just review. We saw that last uh, two weeks ago. If you missed that, you can go online and listen to it or, or watch it as, as well from Saturday to Sunday if you want to look it up. And we, and we saw how they claim themselves. They claim themselves the authority to change the law. And of course, we did see in the scripture that the law does not change. That's why the Bible says that they would intend to change the law. Okay? Because can you really change God's law? The only way you could do that is if you get to heaven, kick God out of his throne, sit in his throne, and then change his law. 
which that will never even happen. But I want to, we're, gonna, we're going to look at this morning <clears throat> at Christ or the Antichrist. And you're going to have to make a decision whether you want to follow Christ or the Antichrist. But, but before we talk about the Antichrist and get into it, there is another, another beast with similar characteristics as we saw there in Daniel 7. If you join me now in Revelation 13, we're going to look at the first beast there in Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13. Verses 1 through 7. Revelation 13, 1 through 7. Here, this is John. Instead, it's not, it's not uh, Daniel, but it's John. And he sees this in a vision, and he says here in verse 1, Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. And the beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth was like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. So they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast. Don't miss that. They worshiped the dragon who gave authority to the beast. And they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemous, and he was given authority to continue for 42 months. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against who? Against God. To blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. And it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given to him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. Wow. We're going to see here the similarities between this beast, which is an odd beast. Did you, did, did you get the, the descriptions there? It's part leopard, part lion, part bear, all mixed up in one. But let's look at the similarities between this beast and the beast of Daniel chapter 7. Okay, uh, forgive me, you can't see there the, the beast. But we're going to see here some characteristics that both beasts have. And we're going to see that actually both beasts is the same power. Is the, the same power. So both of them to begin with are beasts some kind of creature right there in Daniel chapter 7 verse 3 let's just go there and hold your finger in Revelation 13 we're going to be switching from Daniel 7 and Revelation 13 I don't want you to take my word for it I want you to see what the Bible says Daniel chapter 7 verse 3 there it says, Daniel spoke, saying, I saw in my vision the night, and behold, the four winds of heavens and were striking up from the great sea. Verse 3, and four great, what? Beasts came out. And if you go to verse 23, verse 23 in Daniel 7, verse 23, there it says, the fourth beast shall be a kingdom. So there we see that it is a beast, just how we saw in Revelation chapter 1, they're both beasts. Now, what does a beast represent in Bible prophecy? We know that from Daniel chapter 7, verse 17. Daniel chapter 7, verse 17. Where it says, Those great beasts which are four are four kings which arise out of the earth. Okay? Now, a king obviously has a kingdom. If there is no kingdom, what good is a king for? If he doesn't have a kingdom to rule over. So, so these four beasts, a beast in Bible prophecy we see here represents a kingdom. We can also see that in verse 23. In verse 23 that where we just read earlier. The four beasts shall be a fourth kingdom. A fourth kingdom. But what's interesting is that Revelation 13 beast 
is a combination of Daniel 7, four beasts. In Daniel chapter 7, you, you, you have there four beasts. You have there the, the first one in verse 4 is like a lion with wings. The second one is like a bear. The third one is like a leopard with four heads. And the, the fourth one, it doesn't even look like anything that we are familiar. It just says a dreadful beast. So when you go back to Revelation 13, there you see the same characteristics. There where it says in verse 2, which I saw was like a leopard. And his feet were like the feet of a bear and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. Those same characteristics from Daniel are composed, are, are together comprised in Revelation's beast. Revelation's beast. And if you notice, let me see, how many heads does, does Revelation 13's beast have? Hmm? Seven. Seven. And if you take all the beasts of Daniel 7 and add up their heads, how many heads do you have? You have the lion. You have the bear. How many did the leopard have? Four. Four. One, two, three. Six. And you have the beast, the dreadful beast. Seven heads. If you combine all the heads in Daniel 7, and here in Revelation 13, it has seven heads. Seven heads. So, so, so we see the, the similarities there as well. Another thing that we notice is that both beasts come out of the sea. Look at, look at, look at Daniel there, chapter 7, verse 3, where Daniel says, Daniel 7, verse 3. We're going to be flipping back from Daniel 7 and Revelation 13. There it says, And four great beasts came up from the sea. Right from the sea. Just like in Revelation 13, verse 1, I stood and I saw, I stood on the sand of the sea and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea. Out of the sea. Both come out of the water. Out of the waters. And according, to, again, to Bible prophecy, what do waters represent? If we look, man, you guys study your Bibles. Look at Revelation 17. I could believe you, but I'd rather read it in the Word. Amen? Amen. Revelation 17, verse 15. 17, verse 15. Here, John is in vision. And there's another beast in Revelation 17. We're going to get to that in a couple of weeks. But here, in Revelation 17, verse 15, the angel tells John, it says, And he said to me, The waters which you saw were where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. So here we see that, that waters represent <clears throat> population, peoples, a, a populated area. So again, just reviewing, a beast represents a kingdom. And this kingdom is coming out of a populated area where there is lots of people already currently at. Now, besides coming up out of the sea, which represents uh, peoples and nations, both of these beasts speak blasphemy. Notice there in Daniel chapter 7, verse 8. There where it says at the end that it has the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking pompous words. The King James says blasphemous words. Notice also in Daniel 7, verse 25. Talking about the same beast, that it's, it shall speak pompous words or blasphemous against the Most High. And just hold your finger there in Revelation 13. 13, verse 5. This beast also speaks blasphemy. There where it says, And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemous. And he gave his authority to continue. And, and notice even verse 6. Blasphemy against God, blasphemy against his name, and blasphemy and against his temple. So both of these beasts or these kingdoms speak blasphemy, speak, speak against God. Do we see that? Are you with me so far? No? I can go over it again. Now, what does the Bible define as blasphemy? Well, it gives us three definitions what blasphemy 
is. You can write these down or you can just take your bulletin home because they are on there as well. But Mark 2 verse 7, to claim to forgive sin is blasphemy. They accuse Jesus of blasphemy because he forgave sins. And so, so in, in Mark 2 verse 7, they want to stone him and they say, we don't stone you for your good works. We stone you because you claiming to forgive sin, only God can forgive sin. And so, so they accuse, blasphemy is claiming to forgive sin and only God can do that. John 10 33 tells us that claiming to be God is also blasphemy. They want to stone Jesus because he claimed to be God, which he is God. But there the Jews wanted to stone him because he, he claimed the, the position of God. And another characteristic is persecuting the people of God in the name of God is blasphemy. Persecuting the people of God in the name of God is blasphemy. According to 1 Timothy 1, 12 and 13. 1 Timothy 1, 12 and 13, here the Apostle Paul he says, I thank the Lord because he has forgiven me and, and because I used to blaspheme God in persecuting his people. So persecuting the people of God in the name of God is also blasphemy. So we see so far these, these three characteristics that both beasts share. They're, bo they're, they're both beasts, they both come out of the sea, and they both speak blasphemy. That means they both claim to forgive sin, they both claim to be God on earth, and they both persecuted the saints in the name of God. In the name of God. Which is the fourth characteristics. It persecuted the saints. There in Daniel 7, verse 21, we see there where Daniel was shown. It says, I was watching, and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them. Even verse 25 also says, shall persecute the saints of the Most High. You turn to Revelation 13, verse 7. The same beast in Revelation 13, verse 7 says, and it was granted him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. So are we seeing here that both of these beasts are the identical power? Same characteristics. The same characteristics. So if Daniel 7's beast, according to scripture and according to history, to history, there is no other kingdom that fits every single one of these descriptions. Is the Roman Catholic Church state, then in Revelation 13's first beast has to be who? Has to be who? Okay, let's start from the beginning then, shall we? Do, we? do we need to review everything again? If the beast in Daniel 7 is the Roman, church, Roman state church, who is the beast in, Re in Revelation 13? The same. Thank you. You can, you can answer if I, if, if I ask you. <laughs> So Revelation 13, that same beast power has the same characteristics as Daniel's 7. Because remember, a beast in Bible prophecy is a kingdom. So we can't say that, that the beast in Revelation 13 is something else. Or we can't actually be looking for a beast with all of these weird descriptions. You know... So we need to let the Bible interpret itself. And the Bible tells us that a beast is a kingdom, is a nation. So Revelation's 13th beast must be also a kingdom, a nation. And so we see that it's the same, the same power. And besides, also we saw that it persecutes the saints. Here, just a quote from history, history of the rise and influence of rationalism in Europe, volume two. It says that the church of, the Rome, of Rome has shed more innocent blood than other institu institution that has ever existed among mankind will be questioned by no Protestant who has a, a competent knowledge of history. Somebody who really 
You know, you go to any history professor who knows your history, will know that the Roman state church has shed more innocent blood than any other system, any other country. And so here we see that it's, it's a persecuting one as well. Now this power, this kingdom, this power and this kingdom that we're looking at here in, in Revelation 13,